Good evening, everyone. My name is Becky Thompson, and I'm with the Kentucky Beef Network. I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's Backgrounding and Stocker Profitability Conference. Tonight's session one, and we will be covering key concepts for market operations. Tonight's webinar is funded through the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund and the Kentucky Beef Network Grant. We are recording tonight's session, and we will be sharing the links and handouts after the session is over. At any point through tonight's webinar, you can ask a question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will be compiling the questions and asking them at the end of tonight's presentation. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Kenny Burdine to get started with our program. Welcome, Kenny. Thanks, Becky, appreciate it. Let me go ahead and share the screen. We'll get started here. So I'm going to open, I guess, kind of the way Becky also started and just certainly thank, thank the folks who helped fund this. So this, this program in the next two nights will be funded by the Kentucky Development Fund through the Kentucky Beef Network Grant, which is obviously a partnership between the Cattlemen's Office and the University of Kentucky. We work with them closely on a lot of things, and this is one. And to that end, I certainly want to thank Becky for, for her role, for helping us with this and for kind of being our moderator instead of the webinar and everything. Also want to thank both Jonathan and Greg. Uh, the three of us are looking forward to doing this and we've been wanting to do this for a while. This really came out of the cow-calf conferences that we did back in 2020. And uh, we had 12 of those scheduled in 2020. We got five of them in before COVID and we had to cancel seven the rest of the year. And that, that was difficult for us. We were enjoying those, we felt good about them. They were going over well, crowds were good. So we were able to offer one of those back uh, roughly a year ago, uh, virtually. So this is kind of the same thing we're trying to do now for backgrounding and stalker type operations. So we're, we're very excited about what we put together for the next three nights and I'm glad that you're on. Um, certainly we'll stop and take questions at the end of the presentations and certainly at the end. So, so take, you know, take advantage of that and utilize that question and answer button. So I'm going to try and set the tone for what we're going to be doing here um, by laying out some, I guess, some, some market considerations, just kind of framing where we are in this cattle market now, and some of the implications for backgrounding and stocker operations with kind of a focus on some of the areas that we're going to explore further um, tonight, tomorrow night, and again on Thursday nights. So we'll kind of hit some of those as we go. If you just asked me for my two minute elevator speech about the cattle market, um, this is what I would say. You know, I would say that, you know, market fundamentals have improved. And obviously there's some frustrations in the market right now, but you know, it's hard to argue things that look better than they did certainly a year ago. Um, feeder cattle prices are 13, 14% higher than they were about the same time last year. Fed cattle price is about 22% higher. You know, a, a lot of things look better on the cattle end. Um, but there's obviously risk factors out there. I'm going to mention a few of those here this evening as we're thinking about risk management. You know, those of you on this Zoom don't need me to tell you this, but feed costs are, are an issue and a challenge right now. That has implications certainly for what it costs to add pounds to cattle, but also has implications for what the pounds that we add are worth. And the very next topic we're going to talk about after I get done with this piece, Greg's going to talk about cost gain and value gain, because those are, those are key concepts to understand as margin operations. We've got a lot of carry in the futures market, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit here, a little bit more in just a second. But, you know, we're in a situation right now where summer and certainly fall feeder cattle futures are trading at a much higher level than where they are right now, which suggests that we've got an expectation for much higher prices in, in the near future, certainly the time we get to fall. And, you know, in any market, and this is always the case with, you know, background and stocker type operations that are kind of margin oriented. There's typically opportunities, and it's a matter of recognizing those and grabbing them when they're available and kind of jumping on them when you can. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those. And a good chunk of tomorrow is going to be focused on some budgeting stuff where you can kind of look at, okay, you, you know, what is likely profitability given some different scenarios. I'm going to do just a quick, some quick market update stuff here. And I kind of like to frame um, markets sometimes this way and look at just production of our main three meat, of our three big meat species last year and in the current year. I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. So ordinarily, we see an increase in broiler production, chicken production, about a 2 to 3% a year. That's kind of normal. 
you know, obviously 2021 was impacted by a couple of things, mainly an ice storm and, and then some, some decrease in production. Um, and I guess right, right around Memorial Day of last year. So we saw a fairly small increase last year. We see another fairly small increase in 2022. So while we're going to see a more production of broilers this year, that, that's fairly small compared to what's normal. Um, the, pol- the pork sector had a really good year in 2021. Um, hog prices were very high. And of course, the real run up in feed prices didn't really start until about the summer of 2021. So 2021 was a good year overall for the pork sector. They, you know, they were lower production levels, higher hog prices and so forth. And I'm going to see another decrease, it looks like, in 2022. The point that I want to make, though, on the beef side, and it's really the one that's most telling, things really changed in the second half of 2021. It was like we finally kind of worked through that wall of cattle on feed coming that were kind of pushed into 2021 because of COVID. And it was really in the second, you know, the, the second half of the year, third, fourth quarter, when it really started to look a whole lot better. Um, on feed numbers began to kind of drop some, demand improved. And just looking at 2022 versus 2021, when we saw beef production up almost 3% last year, it's going to be down by about the same percent this year. So that's a clear indication that the market fundamentals have improved a lot in the current year. Um, slaughter cattle prices, that's what I'm about fed cattle prices, cattle right at the knife. Like I said, they're about 22% higher than they were this time a year ago. They're actually off about four, four and a half dollars a hundred away from where they were even about four weeks ago or early February, something like that, four or five weeks ago. And again, that's mostly due to trying to process what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now. And that's, that's the big reason we're seeing those prices move. But, you know, a fed cattle market in the 140s, you know, would have seemed almost out of the question this time last year. Another indication that the, you know, the overall beef complex is in a better place. One reason for that, and this occurred throughout all of 2021, we set, an, we set a record for beef exports last year. And I think this was a little bit under the radar screen because we had so many other things going on. But we set a record last year. Um, we saw, you know, pretty, pretty swift movement of beef into a lot of places. But, you know, the, the main one that got a lot of attention was China. You know, China, if I'd been talking to you, what is this, early 2020, if I'm talking to you in early 2019, China was just, was just almost insignificant in terms of what they brought in from the U.S. And they were our third largest export destination in 2021. And although I've only got one month worth of export data for 2022, it was awfully strong. So it points to continued strong exports so far in 2022. So again, another sign that the market fundamentals have, have improved a fair amount over the last little bit. I want to very quickly talk about just kind of where prices are in Kentucky right now. And I'm going to show you just, just two, you know, two state average price charts. On your right is 550 pound medium large frame number one, two steers. On your, I'm sorry, on, on your left is, is my calf prices. On, on the right is what I kind of call heavy feeders. So basically five weights and eight weights. So look first of all, red line there, those 550 pound steer calves. You can kind of see that they flattened out, even pulled back just a little bit from February to the first three weeks of March. And this is really just again, you know, kind of pricing in what we're seeing the uncertainty in in Asia. Much like what COVID did in 2020, it's not so much that it that it decreased calf prices. What it did, it took away some of their potential, right? You know, I'm talking to you today in a normal year, we're probably within two or three weeks of seeing our highest point in the calf market of the year, sometime, sometime between end of March and maybe the second or third week of April. That's usually our seasonal high in the calf market. And what it did, it's taken that away. It, it shaved, I think, maybe five to 10 cents or so off of what these calf prices would be right now because of what's going on out there and the, the uncertainty. We've seen much more impact on heavier feeders and understand there's, there's, many, there's many facets to what the issues in Russia and Ukraine are impacting cattle markets. The feed price elements of it, calf markets are somewhat buffered from right? Because a lot of these calves are placed in grazing programs this time of year here in the next few weeks. So that buffers the feed impact a little bit. So we've got the seasonal improvement in calf prices, and we're seeing some decrease in, in fall feeder cattle futures. 
with the heavy feeders, we've got two, you know, two things going on. We've got a, we've got the fact that they've got to fully bear the run of these higher feed costs because they're, they're going to be placed on feed, no question about it. And at the same time, we've seen those, those fall live cattle futures, what we most likely will be pricing, right? These heavies that are moving through the yards right now on that fall live cattle board, that's pulled back some too. So they're getting hit both on what they're likely to sell fats for come fall and what's going to cost get them to that point. So, so heavyweight steers are feeling much more impact than we are on the calf market. But again, you know, th these prices are above where they were last year across the board. Um, weather is always a major factor. And I want to just kind of show you two things here. So on your left is the drought monitor from this, this would have been, I guess, the fourth week of August in 2021. So last summer, you know, yeah, drought in the summer is always what always was the closest. I think I picked this week because I, I happen to be in Fargo, North Dakota, um, right around the same time doing a program. And Fargo sits right on the North Dakota, Minnesota line. In fact, I actually walked across the Red River just to say I went into Minnesota one morning for some exercise. But I was able to fly in and just see how dry it was out there. And then now kind of look to your right. It's almost like I've taken that drought. I just kind of twisted it a little bit, kind of rotated, if you will. And a lot of that drought now has moved into the Southern Plains. And I say this because understand that, you know, th there's a lot of cattle, a lot of cows up in the Northern Plains. This is a big, certainly a big cow area, big cattle area. But the Southern Plains are where the bulk of our cow is. You know, there, there's over, there's well over 4 million beef cows in Texas alone, throwing Oklahoma and some other states. And, you know, this always bears watching because when we get dry weather in the Southern Plains, that tends to be a major market mover. And again, I'm not making a prediction, but certainly I would just point out that it was, it was three straight severe drought years on the Southern Plains, 2011, 12, and 13, that set us up in large part for some of the best prices we'd ever seen in 14 and 15 in the cattle market. So do be aware that it's, it's early as it is. We're seeing some dry weather in the western half of the U.S. and most importantly in the Southern Plains area. Um, the cow herd is shrinking. You know that. I've written about that. We've talked about it. Um, that's, you know, that, that's well established. I think some perspective on quantity is useful, and I want to do that for just a second here. So if you just look at the last year, in other words, if you look at what happened during 2021, so compare January 2021 to January 2022, USDA estimated the beef cow herd down by almost 2.5%. And... That's always the first thing I look for when I see that USDA inventory report. You know, what was the change in beef cow numbers? Because that determines how, how big the calf crop is. What also went on and didn't get a lot of attention was they also reduced their estimate of the 2021 herd by 314 million cows, which is about another percent, okay? So what they're really saying is, is that over the last couple of years, we've seen the cow down about three and a half percent. And I kind of take a long-term view on this. If I just go back to 2019, so I'm really talking about three years. From January 2019 to January 2022, we've seen about a one and a half million cow reduction in the number of cows that are out there in production. And that's about 5%. And that's pretty significant. Also, you want to look at, okay, how many heifers are being held for beef cow replacement? That number was also down in the January one estimate. So there's certainly no indication of a growing cow herd at that point. And then you combine that with what we're seeing on the drought front with weather, and it's hard to imagine this cow herd's not smaller again come January 2023. So again, the, the, fundamentals, the fundamentals line up really well and point to continued decreasing supplies and generally improving cattle prices over the next little bit. Something that Greg and I both like to do, especially when we talk with audiences that deal with heavy feeder cattle, we like to step back and look at, step back and kind of look at long term, long term um, nearby feeder cattle futures. So, what is the spot? What is the, the most current feeder cattle futures price? And just track that over time. So, on the left-hand side, you can see certainly 2014, 2015, you can see those incredibly high price periods. Notice though, although it looks small in comparison, notice that when we came into 2022, so that right there I'm pointing to is January, okay? 
that was the highest price level we'd seen since that 2014 15 time period. And I think that's worth noting. Now, we've certainly pulled back some in response to what's going on in Asia, but we've still got a fall board in the 180s. Um, we were kind of in the 184 to 186 range for a period of time. Now we're kind of in the low 180s, but that's still as good an opportunity to price cattle as we've had in quite a while. If you think about budgeting and so forth, certainly the next session tomorrow, you know, we'll talk more about that and what that means for what I can pay for calves. I'm placing in grazing programs right now and, and, and certainly calves in the you know, background and feed type programs you might be running here in the current year. Um, we don't talk a lot about carry in cattle markets. Carry tends to be more of a grain term. But what carry really means is the difference between what the current price is and the expectation of price in the future. And the futures market is our best indication of that. So, you know, right now, if I look at April, which, you know, it's, it's March now, but we're kind of starting to think about cash sale on that March futures contract. But, you know, April's trading around 161. I've got November trading at a little at over 184. So there's a $23 improvement in futures price from April to November of the current year. It's been a long time that since we've seen something like that. So the implications are point blank. We've got an expectation of much higher prices come fall compared to what we're seeing right now. So there's implications for calf values. And what it also means is that the current market isn't always a good indication of what to expect. And I've seen people do this before. You know, they might be looking at a program where they're, they're placing five weight calves and they're going to sell eight weights in the fall, which is, you know, it's a common type program. Okay. And they look at what five weights are selling for now. They look at the current price of eight weights and they'll say, okay, so how much, you know, what, you know, what, using the current price of eight weights, can I buy that five weight and make it work? But in reality, that's, that's going to be misleading. The expectation is those eight weights are much, much higher come fall. So you want to look at certainly fall futures. And the very next thing we're going to talk about is actually after, after Greg talks about value of gain and cost of gain, the last, the last short session is going to be focused on, okay, you know, how can I look at, you know, feeder cattle futures for summer and for fall and use that to make an estimate what I'm likely to sell feeder cattle to Kentucky for at the same time. And we certainly got risk factors out there. And I, I want to highlight these quickly. You know, the market right now is trying to price in the effects of the war in Ukraine. And, you know, obviously humanitarian crisis, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to not say that, but just focusing on the cattle side right now, there's a lot of implications, right? You know, we're all well aware of the grain market implications. They're there. And we've talked about how that impacts cattle prices. You know, there's, there's input cost implications that are certainly there. And then with cattle in particular and beef, you've got demand concerns from inflation. In particular, in, in, inflation has been an issue for a while. But in particular, what we've seen, you know, in, in the short run, we, we've seen some, impact, some impact on fuel. And fuel, like anything, it does eat into consumer budgets, obviously. So there's, there's some implication on disposable income there. But the other thing about fuel prices is it's something that most everybody encounters every week, every couple of weeks. And even in my commute, I live about 14 miles south of campus. So you know, even in my daily commute, I bet I see the price of gas 12 times, you know, going to work and 12 times coming back. So it's a constant reminder about inflationary pressure. So, so fuel is something I think we can be especially sensitive to, and we worry about how consumers might respond in those situations. And, and although we, we benefit from this most of the time, it's important to also understand that beef is the most expensive meat that Americans consume. And that makes us vulnerable at times, it makes us vulnerable at times, you know, for um, when, when we're in times where incomes are strapped and there's, there, there's pull on consumer incomes. You know, beef oftentimes can get hit a little bit harder than pork and chicken because it is more expensive pound for pound. You know, there, there's feed price implications, certainly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a grain economist, but I do kind of follow grain markets as a cattle economist. I got new crop corn on the board. So December corn futures today closed, I think, at $6.70. Folks, it's March. Okay, so at this point, you know, we, we don't know what we're going to actually see. But I just posed this question, not a prediction at all, but I just posed this question. If new crop corn is on the board right now at 670, given everything going on, understand that probably assumes something close to a trend yield. 
imagine what a drought in 2022 might do. You know, that, that's going to be something to kind of think about. So again, we have no way to know that, but there's certainly a risk there in the form of potentially higher grain prices going forward, given what weather might, might do for us. And then frankly, I mean, you know, this U.S. economy, you know, there, there's questions. There's been a lot of discussion about inflation now for, I guess, about a year and a half, two years. How sustainable has growth been? You know, how will consumers react to certain things? So, you know, that there's there's macroeconomic concerns there. So I don't want to I don't want to paint a, a grim picture at all. I actually feel good about this cattle market overall. I felt really good about it back in January or February. But I just want to make the point that there's risk factors out there. And on Thursday night, one of the topics we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about livestock risk protection insurance, because I think anybody in a margin type operation, frankly, any type of cattle operation, needs to be looking at ways to manage cattle price risk. And here's some of the risk factors, and LRP is a good tool that they can use to manage that price risk. Um, leave me with a few thoughts here if we go into the cost of gain, value of gain stuff. But, you know, margin operations and market volatility they always go hand in hand. And, you know, I wanted to walk through some of the market fundamentals, but in reality, you all know this, when you're in a margin operation, when you're a background or stock operation, you can make money in a strong cattle market or a weak cattle market, right? What matters the most is your buy-sell margin, you know, what your costs are, and frankly, a lot of timing. And really the last couple of years, timing has been a big, has been a big thing in terms of, big thing in terms of, of uh, understanding profitability for the, those type of operations. So 2020 was a mixed bag. Folks that had wintered cattle through kind of 19, 2020, and that were selling cattle in March, April of 2020 and got hammered, right? Because they had heavy feeders going to market just a horrible time. On the same note, there were some opportunities that spring to get some calves bought pretty cheap and have some pretty good returns to like a, a grazing type program that year. 2021 was a pretty good year. And I would argue again, especially for grazers, because you know, we had some really good heavy feeder cattle prices last fall, especially given what calf prices were like in the spring of 2021. And in 2022, opportunities are going to exist. And you know, budgeting becomes key. And when Greg goes through some of the budgeting standards with you tomorrow, it's what a lot of that's going to be. You know, given given the market, you know, what can I pay for cattle to reach a certain profit level? Um, so budgeting is always crucial for margin operations and then just seizing opportunities when they're there. The other thing, Jonathan's going to talk some um, on Thursday night as well about tax management and just basic financial management. But, you know, we, we can talk about things like LRP to manage risk, but there's also things we can do with our management in terms of, you know, liquid cash, how we manage things, how we plan financially that put us in a better position as well. So we wanted to have that in there at first, you know, that is part of that, you know, kind of managing and protecting your profits going forward. I'm going to kind of end here by just kind of setting up for Greg's discussion. So, so obviously feed prices are running like crazy. This is weekly prices from Omaha. We're kind of in the 720, 725 range right now. Again, new crop, December corn future went off the board. December 2022 corn futures on, on the board at 670. Today, hard to get your head around. I want to show you this really quickly. So, you know, be, being in a city like Kentucky, I, I deal with feeder cattle, calf operations, background or stocker operations. I don't deal with a lot of folks that finish cattle. We're, we're doing more all the time, but it's not something I do a whole lot of. But in terms of estimating feedlot cost of gain, I use a series that comes out of Kansas State where it's, it's almost like a case. They work with five or six custom feeders to collect data on their cost of gain, what they're paying cattle, what they're selling cattle for. So I want you to notice that going back to early 2021, compared to where we ended 2021, cost of gain went from something in the low 80s to the last point I've got here in January, around a dollar 13 or so a pound. So this is one way to think about the implications of feedlot cost of gain from higher feed prices. Now at the same note, understand that in Kentucky, in a state like ours, where we have access to, you know, to, to byproduct feeds, commodity feeds and so forth, our cost of gain won't always match those, which sometimes creates opportunity. And what I like to tell people is, you know, be sure you're not just looking at feed cost. You know, we oftentimes know what feed typically runs, what we typically do. We know what 
you know, a usual buy sell margin is, but all bets are off in a year like 2020. And I'm just saying this because if I simply look at feed cost alone, I might say, you know what, I can't do what I usually do. And folks, that may or may not be true because the market dynamics change when feed prices are high. For one thing, feed yards want to place heavier cattle when feed costs are high. In other words, they, would, they don't want to place five and six weight cattle. They want you to add more pounds here and they want to buy them at 750 and up. What that does in terms of the market is it narrows those price slides. So if you're used to seeing you know, a $6 spread between seven weights and eight weight cattle, that weight, that spread might be three, four dollars or even less. So what that really does, that means the value of the pounds that we add are higher because those price slides are narrower. And a price slide really just, a, it's just a discount, a discount per pound as cattle get heavier. The other thing this does, and we'll this a little bit later, but the, that really tends to support grazing returns because although certainly, certainly grazing costs are gonna go up in 2022 as well, probably not as much as true feed cost and the more we can do there. Plus, when in a market where feed costs are high, those feed lots, again, they're less aggressive on those calves. So sometimes those calves actually get a better buy over their expectation in the fall than otherwise. So this is gonna set up very, really nicely. Our next topic is gonna be focused on value of gain and cost of gain. And Greg's gonna talk through some of that kind of stuff now. All right. So I'm going to introduce basically the concept of, of cost gain, which, which probably everyone knows to some degree, and then value of gain, which, which maybe a few of you don't. Um, we don't necessarily have to use both these in, in together in conjunction, but I'm going to introduce it for the main reason that, that right now, particularly for some of the reasons Kenny talked about, that we're in unique times, unique situations. You may want to take cattle to heavier weights, and by understanding cost of gain and, and being able to compare that to value of gain, uh, you can see how maybe you want to change, um, again, your, both your placement weights and, and maybe your uh, weights that you take the cattle to. So that said, let's introduce cost again. Um, and the reason we're going to do this again is, is for the reasons Kenny was talking about, but also it's, it's often misused. Um, and I'll explain that here in a second. So let me first define it. So cost gain, most of us understand it's going to be the non-calf cost. So we don't include the cost of the calf itself, but all the other costs divided by how many pounds that we're adding on average to, to a calf. And that's going to give us our cost of gain. So it's best to use examples just to make sure we're on board. So let's say we're buying a 500 pound calf. Uh, we're going to take it to roughly 800 pounds. And let's say we have $300 in non-calf costs. So probably primarily feed costs. We'll talk about some of the other ones you, you would want to include. Um, let's say the sale price is going to be $1.40. That will be more important later on. We don't necessarily need that for the cost of gain. So the, the cost of gain would be the $300 non-calf costs and divide by how much weight we're adding to that. So again, we're, we're going from 500 to 800 pounds. So we're adding 300 pounds of gain. And I made the math real easy on purpose here. So 300 divided by three, $300 divided by 300 pounds is three or is a dollar per pound. So really easy cost to gain there. So what I want you to think about now is in this situation, we have a cost of gain that's a dollar. And remember the sale price in that example is a dollar 40. That's we're gonna sell the 800 pound calf. So it looks like we have a cost of gain that's less than that sale price. And, and thus we should be able to make a profit on that animal. And this is where we can get into trouble because uh, it's only true in one very unique situation. And that's, that's only, it's, it's only true if there's no price slide on that calf going from 500 pounds to 800 pounds. In other words, if we bought it for $1.40 and we sold it for $1.40, we, we can look at that analysis, but, but not if um, in a typical situation where we have a price slide, uh, that won't hold true. So what we'll actually need to do is compare that cost of gain to the value of gain, which again is, is what we're gonna be defining here. And essentially, it's going to be that comparison that we can figure out how far should we potentially take the calf, uh, particularly given the changing markets. Now, I'm just going to very quickly introduce value of gain. I'm going to come back to it in a little bit more detail in about uh, eight, nine minutes here. But just for the time being, I'm just going to introduce, I'm just going to basically show how, how quickly that value of gain changes based on the price slide. Um, so if our... In, our sale price is going to be $1.40 for still, but now I want you to think about what ver with various buy prices for that 500 pound calf, what would the value of gain be? 
So if in fact we're able to buy that calf for dollar forty at five hundred pounds and sell at eight hundred pounds for dollar forty, very unlikely, right? But if we were, the value of gain will be a dollar forty. That's that unique situation that we typically aren't to have. Now, if we just had a ten cent um, slide going from five hundred pounds to eight hundred pounds, so in other words, if we bought that calf for dollar fifty um, and sold it for dollar forty, three hundred pounds later, that value of gain would be a dollar dollar twenty three. If we bought it at a dollar sixty, and the value of gain is a dollar seven. If we bought it for a dollar seventy, it's ninety cents. So, in other words, it keep that value of gain keeps going down. Um, the more that we pay for that calf initially. We'll come back to how we determine that value of gain here in just a little bit. But the main concept that I want you to see is that value of gain is going down as, a, as we have a higher price slide. Um, so we can't simply com compare the cost of gain to what we're gonna sell it for. We've got to compare that cost of gain to the value of gain. All right, so we will come back to value gain in five minutes or so. But first, let's go back to cost of gain and just see how that how that changes as that cap grows. So in other words, if we buy it at 500 pounds as it grows in 50 pound increments, how is that gonna change the cost of gain? And the assumption here I'm making is that this is just gonna be a 50-50 uh, corn gluten soy hull mix that we're feeding roughly half its ration and roughly the rest of its ration, the other half uh, with, with good quality hay. Um, and this, the corn gluten soy hulls, I'm um, uh, pricing that at two, $280 a ton, the hay $75 a ton. And our expected gain is 2.3 pounds a day. All right, so the first 50 pounds, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna not show this from 500 up. I'm gonna show this roughly from probably a, a range of weights you might consider selling that animal because that's really where comparing the value of gain and cost gain is, is gonna be most, uh, where we're really gonna wanna do that. Not, not necessarily from 500 to 600, even 650, but think around where you typically sell it at and then bury that by maybe hundred pounds. And that's what we're gonna to try to do here. So think of maybe you're, you typically sell eight or 850 pounds. So our, going from 700 pounds to 750 pounds, uh, that 50 pounds, it's gonna cost us $39 uh, in feed cost to get us there. Um, and so the way we figure out that feed cost gain is just divide that $39 by 50, gives us 78 cents. Um, and as we see here, as we keep increasing the size of that animal, we're, we're putting more feed into it. So that cost of gain is going up a little bit and, that, and the feed cost of gain is going up proportionally. So it's going from 78 to 84 cents a pound. Once we get to 850, it's up to 90, 96 at 900 pounds and, and a dollar at 950 pounds. So the, the feed cost gain keeps going up. Now, the key here also is, is we have some other costs in addition to feed. Now, if you're backgrounding, typically feed's gonna be obviously the biggest cost, but we need to think about what other costs are gonna change as that cap grows. Um, so think about those other costs and, and the ones I'm gonna concentrate on are, are interest on the calf, mineral water, if, if you're on county city water and some, some other miscellaneous costs we'll throw in there. Labor, you know, you don't, I know some people that formally include that, some that don't, uh, and you can do it fine either way. If, if you don't include it formally, just realize whatever the return that you're looking at needs to compensate you for that. So it's fine doing it either way. It's just we have a, a slightly different um, uh, way that we need to think about that return that we're getting. So here's, and all these are going to be examples, and they're meant just strictly to be examples. And, and in some cases, I'm making them eat the math easy just so you can follow along quickly. So here's interest. Let's say that we, we bought that calf for $1,000. Let's say that you know, we, we've either our, our own internal interest rate that we want is 5% or we're borrowing money at 5%. That means our, our interest charge can be $500 a year. Now we wanna put that on a per day basis and I'll show you why here in a minute. So for one day, we're simply gonna divide that, that $50 by 365 days in a year and that gives us 14 cents per day interest charge. Uh, water, again, these are just all examples. Um, by the way, most people probably don't know what the, their water rate is, so I'd encourage you to, to maybe figure that out. You can just simply call them, uh, whoever your water company is and, and ask them how much, you know, once, usually in Kentucky, once you get above 2,000 or 3,000 gallons, there's a per charge per 1,000 gallons. Uh, where I live in, in uh, Southern Woodford County, it's roughly $5 per 1,000 gallons, so I'm using that. So $5 divided by 1,000 gallons means that the average gallon charge is, is a half a cent per gallon, 0.005 cents per gallon. Now, if we assume on average kind of midpoint 
in the growing period that that calf is using 10 gallons of water a day, uh, we'd simply multiply that half a cent per gallon times 10 gallons, and the cost for that water is going to be, on average, five cents per day. Uh, mineral, the way at least I think about this, think about your typical time you're going to keep a calf um, and think about what it costs you on average. So obviously the way you do this, if you, if you have 50 calves, you figure out the total mineral cost, divide that by the 50 calves, that's your, your total cost per calf. Um, and whatever, you know, probably for backgrounding, it's not going to be 150 days. I do more stocking type, so it's, it's longer. Um, so you, you would divide um, that total per head by how many days you're going to keep it. In this case, I'm using 150, and that gives me an estimated mineral cost of five cents per day. Again, I'm, I'm trying to keep some of the, uh, these even in that. So think of them just as examples. Um, so here's an example of, of total cost. I've got the interest at 14 cents a day, the water at five cents, mineral at five. And then there's you're going to have some other costs, smaller ones, um, but I encourage you to kind of think of those. It's going to be something greater than zero, but in my case, I've got it three cents. So if we add all those together, I've got 27 cents per day for all those other costs again, other than uh, the feed itself. If you if you were lucky enough not to be in county water, in other words, you had a good well or something you're using, and so that was essentially zeroed out. This in this example, you'd be at 22 cents a day. Now, for the example I'm going to use now, I'm just going to assume 23 cents a day, just basically to keep the math simple, because our, our rate of gain on average is 2.3 pounds a day, so it works out easily. So in other words, convert whatever your other cost of gain is, divide that by your average daily gain. That will give you essentially those other costs um, on, a, on a per day basis. So 0.23 cents per day, divide that by 2.3 pounds. That gives us a, a total other cost of gain of 10 cents per pound that we add, if that makes sense. In other words, uh, we want to, in the end, we want to know how much is it costing us to add one pound. That's what we do with cost of gain. All right, so I, I did the, I made the math easy. So it was at 10 cents, just so you, it's easy to follow along. But basically, we, we've already got our feed cost of gain that you saw before. I'm just going to add 10 cents to that across the board. Realistically, it's probably going to go up a little bit. In other words, the calves are using a little bit more mineral when they're bigger or smaller. So if you want to go to that detail, you can actually try to estimate that, but, but probably for the purpose of what we're doing here, just an average for those other costs since they're fairly smaller, probably fine. So I'm just bumping the feed cost gain up by 10 cents to get us our total cost of gain. So it ranges from 88 cents at 750 pounds to $1.10 at 950 pounds. All right, so now we're going to go back to um, the value of gain and the concept that we need to kind of look at that's really important is the price slide that you have once those, those calves get in in kind of that finish or not finishing but the final weight that you're going to sell that's going to have an important impact on that value gain that we'll see here so we're going to vary the price slide to show you how that changes and we're going to start with what i i and i think kenny think is is probably pretty realistic for the current um environment that we're in probably about a $4 per, per, per hundred weight slide for heavier weight cattle. So once we get about 700 pounds, it's going to be different uh, at five or 600 pounds, but probably we're somewhere around $4 per hundred weight right now. So <clears throat> the assumption staying with the same example is that 800 pound steer is going to sell for $1. forty right now. And of course that's going to vary by the market. It's probably a little hot. It's probably higher than that in, in large lots. Uh, but again, just think of this example. This is, you would want to tailor this for your operation. So if a 800 pound steer is selling for $1.40 and we have a $4 slide per 100 weight, basically every 50 pounds, it's going to go up or down two cents. So if, if the weight goes up, it's going to go down two cents every 50 pounds. If the weight goes down uh, the, from 800 to 750, it's going to go up by two cents. And that's what we see here. Um, total revenue is just simply obviously the weight times that sale price gives us total revenue. And, and now I'm going to show you how to figure out that value of gain. So we're going to start at 750 pounds since that essentially the, the only one we're, we're starting at 700 pounds, but we can't figure out uh, the value of gain unless we have that revenue for the previous weight, which we don't hear. So we're going to start at 750. Um, and basically we're going to take the total revenue at 750 pounds, subtract the total revenue from 700 pounds and divide that by how much weight we've added in that increment. In this case, every increment is going to be 50 pounds. 
Um, so again, that's how you, that's the value gained the $1,065 minus the $1,008 uh, difference between 750 and 700 pounds, divide that by 50 pounds, that gives us a value of gain of $1.14. And so we fill that in. So now we're going to go from 750 to 800 pounds and do the same thing. We're just going to start at, at 1,120. Then we're going to subtract 1,065, divide that by the, the 50 pounds, and our value gain now is $1.10. So we fill that in. And I won't go through the math on the rest, but that's how we do it. But notice what is going on with that value gain. It's going down as, as we add weight to that animal. So the cost of gain is going up, and the value of gain is going down. So at some point, the two are going to cross, and, and basically that's the highest weight we'd want to take an, an animal to, and, and most likely we'd want to stop some, some, at some point before we get to that point where they cross, and we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that later on. Um, first, I want to show you how that value gain changes by price slide. So that was a $4 slide per 100 weight. What if we had a $6 slide per 100 weight? So again, we'll start with that $1.40. So instead of, of if it's six dollars per hundred weight, it would be a three dollar slide per, per fifty pounds. So again, we'll go instead of going up or down by two cents, we're going to go up or down by three cents a pound. So seven fifty would be a dollar forty three, eight fifty would be a dollar thirty seven. So I've already done the math. I'm not going to take you through all those individual steps, but the value gain is going to just the same process that we used, and, and I can fill that in now. And notice what happened to that value gain. It, it actually goes down compared to the four dollar slide. So in other words, the bigger slide that we have, the more it's costing essentially to, to keep adding 50 pounds because the price is going down quicker. So that value gain is dropping. And if we can, and here's a six dollar slide. So look at that. And I'm going to show you the four dollar slide kind of highlight and you can see the difference. So there's a four dollar slide, there's a six dollar slide. So the six dollar slide that value gain is going down. All right, and now I'm gonna show you a $2 slide. I don't think that's realistic in the current environment, but if feed cost get, get, gets high enough, we couldn't see a $2 slide. Supposedly there was some year, maybe in 1996, that we had basically no price slide for 100 weight um, in, that, in a certain period of time in that unique situation when, when the corn price was really high. So $2 slide, that value gain goes up even higher than there's that $2, uh, there's a $4. So that's the main concept I'm, I'm trying to get to is that, that that value of gain will change based on that price line. All right, now we're gonna compare the two. So we're gonna look at value of gain, we're gonna look at cost gain, put the essentially evaluate the two together and determine uh, given our market conditions, which we're gonna kind of use the price slide to kind of talk about different types of market conditions, how long you'd wanna potentially take that animal to compared to maybe a normal year. And we're going to start with a four dollar price slide, and we're going to stick with that dollar forty um, sale price for the eight hundred pound steer. All right. So the value gain is what we looked at for that four dollar price slide, and that total cost gain, which would include uh, not just feed costs but all those the ten cent additional costs per pound um, that we looked at initially. So we've got a value gain in that second column, the total cost gain in the right hand column. And basically, we can kind of go through here and just look at this now. So let's start at 750 pounds. So our, our value of gain of, of adding that last 50 pounds was $1.14 per pound. Uh, the total cost gain was 88 cents per pound. So basically, the difference there, and I should have gone through this and figured this all out ahead of time, but, but basically, it uh, looks like it's 26 cent um, difference between the two that, that value of gain is higher. Um, so we're, we've gained about $13 or so by, by adding that last 50 pounds. In other words, if, if our choice was selling at 700 pounds or taking the 750 pounds, we gained about $13 by doing that. So that was good. We probably want to do that. What about going to 800 pounds? We gained um, 16 cents here, which for 50 pounds would equate to $8. So again, probably makes sense to do that. Um, we go to 800 pounds. 850 pounds. Now that value gain is just six cents higher than the, than the cost gain. So at 50 pounds, that essentially translates to we've gained three dollars by adding that last 50 pounds. So probably we wouldn't do that. In other words, that that last uh, three dollars for that 50 pounds, which probably was about 20 days or so of keeping that cap, may not have been worth it, depending on if you build in your labor or not. Would be my guess. And also depending on are you make, trying to is are your facilities going to be empty for the next 
two months, or are you going to try to turn another set of cattle? So that would have to factor into that decision. Um, obviously, we would we would not in this situation we, we would not go to nine hundred pounds because our total cost of gain for that last fifty pounds was higher than than the value of gain. In other words, we we lost in this case not a lot, um, but it was a four cent difference per pound. So for fifty pounds. Um, that would equate to two dollars. So we lost two dollars by taking the last fifty pounds. So we wouldn't want to do that. Obviously, not go to nine fifty. All right. So what I'm going to do now is that was a four dollar price slide. What if we have a three dollar price slide, which I think is is very possible given the current um, environment for feed costs. So if we had a three dollar price slide, the, the total cost gain is going to stay the same. It's just that value of gain that's going to change. It's going to go up a little bit because that price slide went down. So we can kind of look at that same thing. So if you remember 850 pounds, that was kind of marginal before we made a little bit, but probably didn't make sense to do it. In this case, um, every pound we're adding 14, the, the value of gain is 14 cents higher than the cost to, to get that last pound. So for 50 pounds, we gained $7 for that last 50 pounds. So it probably would make sense uh, to do it. In this case, if we had a $3 price slide versus if we had the four and it probably didn't. Um, would we take it to 900 pounds? In this case, we gained about $3. So again, probably not. Um, but at least we, we, we decided to go from probably 800 to 850 pounds with a $3 price slide. Now, the $1. forty is probably more applicable where the market is right now if you were selling right now. But what if this decision was in the fall with the, with the current market environment predicted for the fall? And that's what I'm trying to do here. So in other words, I'm just roughly saying that that steer would probably be worth around $1.60, and we'll refine that in tomorrow's um, presentation. But we'll still use the $3 price slide, but we'll, we'll bump up that sale price to $1.60. So the, I won't go through the details, but basically that's going to bring that value of gain up. The total cost gain stays the same. So that same 900 pound uh, situation that before we, we decide probably at 2 or $3 didn't make sense to do it in this case. If in fact it was three dollar price slide, the difference for every pound between that value gain and, and the cost gain now is uh, twenty six cents. So essentially, we would gain thirteen dollars roughly for adding that last fifty pounds, going from eight fifty to nine hundred. We would definitely do it in that case. Uh, what about going up to nine hundred fifty pounds? The difference there is eighteen cents. So we'd gain nine dollars adding that last fifty pounds. Probably makes sense in that situ situation. So the market basically would be telling us if, if we got to this, and again, I don't know if we're gonna have a $3 price, I'm just saying if we did, that's the market's way of saying we want heavier, we want you to take those animals to heavier weights. And, and it just makes intuitive sense. Price of corn, if the feedlot is getting really high, they, they generally want you to continue to add pounds uh, above what you would normally do. So that's kind of how that would, that would potentially work. And we, we don't have a thousand pounds here, but potentially the market may even want you to take or at least the market may want some people to take it to that thousand pound mark. Uh, that was a $3 price slide. What if we have a $4 price slide, which is about where we're at now, it's gonna bring that value of gain down. So would we take it to 950 pounds? Uh, the difference is eight cents per pound. So at 50 pounds, that would be $4 gain for that last 50 pounds. For, so probably not, definitely if, if we did not include labor um, in, that, in those other total costs of gains. So, we'd probably stay around 900 pounds if, if the price slide was in fact $4. Um, how are we doing on time? Doing good. All right, that's all I have um, for my part of the presentation. And we're gonna take questions at the end. So how are we doing? It, it may be a good place if, if someone has specific questions given the details we have. If not, we'll, we'll take additional questions at the end. Kenny's still got one more presentation um, after this. Greg did a great job. And I was thinking when he was talking, I don't know if you actually heard me or not, Greg, you may have been trying to get here at the time, but you know, one of the comments I made on talking about the market was that in these high feed price times, you know, feedlots prefer to place heavier cattle. And, and that's true. But as Greg pulled together the value to gain and cost to gain discussion there at the end, you know, what really struck me was he did a good job laying out from the, from the, from the background or perspective, from the, from the, you know, the grower perspective, you know, why it also makes sense in those high value gain times for, for those folks to be selling acre cattle. And that's how market dynamics work. So really good job, I thought. So the last piece we're going to talk about is really going to kind of set the stage for, for tomorrow. So 
Greg will be doing a lot of the heavy lifting tomorrow on budgeting scenarios. And, you know, we're going to roll up our sleeves and jump into some budgeting stuff. And there's a lot that goes into that. But, you know, one of the key pieces is understanding, okay, how do I use the futures market to make an estimate for what I'm going to sell feeder cattle for in the future? And that's really what I'm going to do here for the next probably 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to take a couple minutes here and just talk through some basics of the futures market. Just not anything to do with risk management, but just, just to understand what the futures contracts are. So when you see a feeder cattle futures price, understand that's something very specific. First of all, that's 50,000 pounds of feeder cattle. So that, that is a that is a truck, that is a semi-truck load full of feeder cattle. They're medium and large frame, number one, two muscles. Average weight is 800 pounds. If you, if, so if you got some gray hair like me, you remember that being 750 not too long ago, but it's been 800 pounds now, I think since maybe 2013 or something. In fact, if memory serves me correct, it may have been 700 pounds early in my career. I'm in my 23rd year, so it may have even gone up 100 pounds since I started, but 800 pounds. So bottom line, when you think feeder cattle futures, think, think a truckload, a medium large number one, two steers that weigh 800 pounds. Um, we trade futures up until the last Thursday of the contract month. So the month we're in now, March, is kind of an unusual month because the last Thursday actually falls on the 31st. So we will literally trade the March contract until next Thursday. So we've still got seven trading days. So we're really not starting to cash settle that thing just yet. But when we do, it's cash settled at the CME feeder cattle index. And I don't want to jump into the muddy water here, but I do just want to make the point that what that means is at expiration, when we stop trading that March contract, it's going to automatically go off the board at whatever the CME index is, which is a seven day weighted average of actual feeder cattle sales in that category. So everything between 700 and 900 pounds that are medium and large trim or one, two steers. We exclude cattle that have got dairy influence, that are fleshy, that are thin, that have any sort of designation beyond just run of the mill cattle. And it's in those 12 states I've got listed there. If you just kind of picture kind of from the Southern Plains up to the Northern Plains, the Southern part of the US, that's kind of the 12 state area that we think about. The reason I want to mention this is because a lot of folks I think, you know, don't always understand the link between the futures market and actual cattle prices. And sometimes we get things out of whack in some markets, but I personally like cash settlement. And I like the way it works in feeder cattle because I know that at the end of the month, that contract's actually going to be based on what actual feeder cattle sales are, the actual prices. And there's a lot of cattle going to that index. So what that means, you know, simply put, if somebody had, had bought a futures contract and, you know, in early March and they set on that thing until it closed, it's going to automatically get sold back at the index. So that keeps futures prices from getting too bizarre because the last Thursday of the month when we stop trading, that's kind of reckoning day. And that's actually tied to actual cattle sales. Now, when we start thinking about using the futures price and then turning it into an actual price expectation in Kentucky, we need to know the concept of basis. So basis is the difference between the local price, the Kentucky price, and what the futures price is. So the simple formula that you usually learn in a, in a classroom or in a setting like this is that the local price minus the futures price is basis. Now, when I teach it in class, when I teach it in, you know, in futures and options trainings that I might do, I think of it like an adjustment factor. Just simply, how do I adjust that futures price to make it make sense for Kentucky? So I tend to use the term over and under more than I kind of think about positive and negative basis. So you'll hear me say something like 800 pound steers in Kentucky are selling $6 under the April board. And what that means is if I look at what 800 pounders are selling for in Kentucky, and compare it to what the April futures price is. If April future, if April, if April futures is at 166, those eight weights in Kentucky are 160. If April futures are at 125, here in Kentucky we're at 119. So I'm just I like the over and under term a little bit better. It's a little bit more um, intuitive for I think folks to actually think about. So I like over and under as well. Now th this should be review for most of you. So forgive me if I'm backing up too much, but to understand basis, understand kind of, you know, where Kentucky sits in the general cattle system. So January 1, 2022 numbers, this is where the beef cows are. I mentioned this earlier, we got a lot of cows in the Southern Plains, 
a lot of cows in the northern plains, and quite a few cows in the southeast. Kentucky's got you know just under a million beef cows right now. As soon as I advance the slide though, and I go from showing you where the cows are to where cattle on feed are, you'll see a big difference. So, so kind of focus your eyes there on Kentucky. These are cow numbers. Here's cattle on feed numbers. And obviously we want you to understand, and this you know, right, is that we've got a lot of cows in Kentucky. We produce a lot of calves. We don't finish many of those calves. So most of our cattle are gonna move from the Southeast, a state like Kentucky, into these major cattle feeding areas that are concentrated largely around where most of the corn is produced, right? So here's Iowa, okay? And then obviously down the Southern Plains. So most of our cattle are gonna move that direction to be fed. So that's why most folks you know, recognize pretty, pretty quickly that transportation cost to these major cattle feeding areas is the main reason why we have the difference between Kentucky feeder price and what feeder cattle futures are. So I always like to say that you wanna think about Futures markets, first of all, is a price forecast, and that's really what they are. It's a price forecast or a market expectation for feeder cattle in the future. So right now, there's an August 2022 feeder cattle futures contract being traded. And you can think of that as an expectation for feeder cattle prices in August. Sorry, in October. And if I think, if I ask you the question where, so if we think about that October feeder cattle futures price, expectation for feeder cattle prices come October, and I ask you, well, where? Well, the answer is it's in those major cattle areas included in the index, right? It's in those 12 states, right? That October futures price really is the expected price of an 800 pound steer on average in those 12 states come October. And it really is that simple. And if I just say, okay, so do Kentucky prices differ from prices in those 12 states? And the answer is yes, and that's what basis is. So I think sometimes folks just tend to overthink basis. It's just the differential between our prices and prices out there in the major cattle feeding areas. That it really is that simple. So when we start thinking about things that would affect basis, you have to understand that if, if something affects the market and both futures prices and Kentucky prices move about the same amount, basis doesn't change, the differential doesn't change. So you have to think about, okay, what are things that would affect them differently? So transportation is obviously the big one, you know, changes in transportation costs, that's certainly one that would make a big difference. You know, there can be quality differences, right? There's cattle of different quality that sell in Kentucky. You know, a really good set of cattle will sell for more than a, than a poor set of cattle, which means the basis on those better set of, the basis, the basis on that better set of cattle will be stronger or closer to futures than the weaker, than the, uh, the poor set of cattle. So quality matters. One that doesn't get enough attention in Kentucky is lot size. And, you know, I'll have people call me sometimes and they'll say, you know, I just, I just looked at what 800 pound cattle are selling for in Nebraska. And I saw the same thing for Kentucky. And there's a 15 cent difference, for example. And they'll say, you know, transportation costs shouldn't be over five or six cents a pound or something like that. And that's true. You know, what, what, what they're saying is spot on correct. We have to also remember though, that cattle sell in a lot larger groups out in those states. So part of the reason why our average prices tend to be lower is because in addition to the transportation cost, we tend to sell cattle in smaller lots. And that makes a difference too. So another reason why our basis tends to be lower, or you might say more negative or more under, is because of lot size in a lot of cases too. If I've truly got a pot load of cattle in Kentucky and a similar pot load of cattle in you know, Nebraska or Iowa or Kansas, then yeah, the difference should be a whole lot closer to just transportation cost differences. But, uh, but, but a lot of size matters too. And then local supply and demand conditions. You know, you will have situations where things are different in Kentucky than they are out west. You know, maybe, maybe there's, there's something related to our market, certain types of cattle, number of cattle that run through. Maybe we have an isolated drought in an area that forces, you know, kind of an unusually large number of cattle to move in Kentucky that we didn't see out west. So those kind of things can impact our prices versus others. So just kind of get some ideas here. So if you think about something like how, you know, how would an increase in fuel price? You know, we're we're dealing with this now, right? Diesel fuel, I think, is pushing five bucks a gallon now. I think if I'm not mistaken, we're getting pretty darn close anyway. You know, how does that impact basis? Well, that increases transportation costs, right? So that should impact Kentucky prices much more native than prices that are kind of, that are of cattle that are in those major cattle feeding areas. So our basis tends to widen, it tends to get more negative. I mean, the difference between Kentucky price and prices out west tends to, tends to actually increase. 
you know, you can think about weather patterns. I mentioned right earlier, you know, what if we have an ice storm here that makes transportation of calves difficult at a certain period of time? Well, that impacts, you know, that impacts the value of those cattle moving west. That can impact our prices and oil prices out there. You know, when we've got wet and cold conditions. You know, there, there's some stress on cattle during transportation. You know, don't think for a minute that doesn't impact the value of our cattle as we think about how those transportation um, stresses get kind of built into the marketplace. So this is this is something I pulled down last week. I, I pulled most of this together last week. I was on the road Thursday and Friday, so I'm about a week behind of what I'm showing you right now. Week seven, seven to nine days, something like that. But I think this is from last Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. So it's kind of noted, and, and prices aren't that much different, a dollar or two at most. But you know, at the time I had March heater cattle futures at about 153.40, April about 158. I mentioned that carry had a whole lot of carry in the fall market. When we start thinking about futures, though, the first I start thinking about basis, the first thing to think about is okay, what is what is the current futures market? So you know, what is the current price of, of cattle? And you know, as of right now, we would if you know if, if we were looking at this last week, we're looking at that March March beer cattle futures contract. That's the spot contract. Now, the same time I pulled that together, this was a market report from just a given area. So again, March was around 153. If I'm not mistaken, this is from the Stanford Kentucky auction, and I think it maybe was maybe two thirds ago. Uh, grabbed this, so I, I tried to match the times as best as I could. Obviously, day to day would be the ideal way to do this. But at the time, you know, I had a group of 74 steers that averaged right at 700 pounds, so for 153. So I could say, okay, you know, the basis on those 700 pound steers and basically a truckload was almost zero. Okay, you know, here's here's a lighter muscle group of steers that sold for 140. The basis there was was something like 13 under. Um, you know, here's some heavy eights. Okay, 59 hit a uh, roughly 869, you know, they were at 144. So that basically was roughly nine under. So, you know, I tell people when you think of, you'll, you'll hear people say sometimes those cattle sold well. And oftentimes what they really mean is those cattle sold well relative to the basis, right? Meaning that, you know, that was a pretty strong basis sale from what a lot of other people might've might thought. So think about basis that way. When you, when you see cattle move, don't just think about cattle price and value. Think, okay, how did that compare to the current Either cattle futures price. So simple example. Let's say the April board's at 160. Okay. And it's actually pretty close to that. So April board's at 160. Let's say I see a group of 800 pound feeder steers go through a market and they sell for 150. Oh, well, there's an implied basis there, right? Those cattle sold for $10 under the April board. But that's kind of a simple example. 800 pound steers, futures based on 800 pound steers. So this is mostly transportation cost differences, a little bit more in this case, but about a $10 under basis, okay? What if a group of heifers sold that very same day right after those steers sold? Okay, maybe it's a smaller group, for example. 800 pound feeder heifers sold for $1.34. Well, if that's the case, right, they were $26 under the April board. So the steers were 10 under, heifers 26 under. Again, both are just basis, basis figures based on what I actually saw happen in the marketplace. What if a group of 700 pound steers sold? Let's stop and think for a second. So we know if the cattle weighed exactly 100 pounds, that there's a transportation cost differences largely. So that should matter, okay? In this case though, I've got a lighter steer in Kentucky here selling 700 pounds. You know, Greg talked about price slides kind of briefly, but you know, the same thing applies here. So that seven weight should outsell the eight weight in most markets. So maybe those seven weights sell for $1.54. So they sold for four bucks a hundred weight more than the eight weights. Well, if that's the case, it's a slightly different price, slightly different weight. But again, I've got April board at 160. I've got these 700 pound steers at 154. They sold for $6 under the April board. So just, you know, when you think, when you see cattle sell, when you sell a group of cattle, kind of make a quick conversion in your mind what that meant for actual basis. How did they sell relative to the board? Now, we're going to add a layer of complexity. We're going to talk about tracking basis over time. I'm going to show you a chart and talk about a few things, but I want to also show you a couple of ways you can think about actually using futures to make, using basis to make some expectations for prices for yourself. So there does tend to be some seasonality to basis. It's not perfect. It's not super easy to predict, but there are some patterns that we tend to see, and I want to share those with you. So when you think about seasonality now, think, okay, 
what are things that would affect Kentucky prices differently than futures price? And how do those change throughout the, the season? Think month by month. So are there times when we have more of a certain type of cattle moving through the marketplace? Are there times of the year when cattle may be more stressed during transportation? Are there times of the year when weather patterns are different? Are there times of the year when maybe fuel prices are different? Because all of those things could lead to a seasonality element when it comes to basis. So, you know, right now is a really good example, you know, that we've got extremely high fuel prices. And Greg and I were talking about this actually this morning. We were kind of preparing for some of this stuff we've been talking about this evening. We we're talking about how, you know, transportation costs have moved up quite a bit, maybe even more so than the, the actual price of fuel would, would make you think it would. But you know, what else has gone up at the same time? So fuel prices are up, which absolutely, absolutely impacts transportation costs. You know, ownership costs of, of vehicles, you know, trailers, semis, that's gone up. We know about labor costs. So all of those things really do drive transportation costs and we absolutely impact basis. Now, the chart that I'm showing you, really what I've, I've got here, I've got, I, I like to do five years of, of uh, monthly based at a time. So, this is the last five years from 2017 to 2021. So 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. The blue line you see there is five years. I'm averaging all five of those years basis by month. The black line is a three-year basis. I'm just averaging 19, 20, and 21. I like to give you kind of some sort of idea. And again, there, there's not a perfect way to do this. All I can do is take the average price, okay, of cattle in this case at 800 pounds, and oh, shoot, I made a mistake. This should be 800 pounds, and I apologize, I did not fix that. This is 800 pound steer. I'll, I'll fix that for the handout for you. My apologies. So I take the average price of 800 pound steer, and then I compare that to what the average futures price was for that month. That's all that I can do. So the average daily close there for that month. So what we tend to see is basis tends to be stronger in the spring. So here's kind of the April May time period. And again, a little bit more in the summer. We usually see weaker basis in June and July, meaning we see more negative or more under basis in, in June and July. But remember, we don't have a June or July feeder cattle futures contract. So when we look at June cattle prices to get basis, I'm comparing those to August feeder cattle futures. So that's why we see basis a little bit lower or weaker in June and July. Then we see basis weaker in fall and winter. And this is something you can typically set your clock by that we see basis lower in you know, October, November, December time period. And again, you know, one thing to think about there that we talked about was, you know, just think about, we, we move a lot of our calves right from Kentucky in the fourth quarter. We've probably got a certain amount of, you know, kind of trucking infrastructure in the area. We've got more demand for that trucking infrastructure in the fall because not only are we moving these heavier feeders, but a whole lot of our spring-born calves are moving on to, you know, into growing programs or maybe on wheat pasture or something there in the, late fourth quarter. So probably that drives up trucking costs somewhat too, which tends to kind of weaken basis. So just, you know, understand those basic patterns. Um, you know, these are not things that are perfect, but just know the basic patterns. Basis tends to be stronger in the spring and in the summer, well, late summer, I should say. So uh, I think August, September, and then usually weaker in June, July, because we're comparing that to an August board and then almost always weaker kind of in the fourth quarter. And November seems to be the real problem child in terms of basis most years. So there's a couple of ways this can be done. And, and again, where we're really going here to kind of wrap things up tonight is we're going to be going, okay, how can I use the futures market, the futures price to estimate what I might sell cattle for in the future? Now, Greg will do this again with you tomorrow in a little different approach. So we want to show you a couple of different ways to do this. Oftentimes, it's done just like I'm showing you here on the slide. My price ex expectation becomes the futures price for the month I'm going to sell plus basis. So if I'm going to be sell cattle in October, I'm going to use the October feeder cattle futures price. If it happens to be I'm selling cattle in June or July, like this earlier, I'm going to use the August feeder cattle futures price. Then I'm just going to add my basis estimate. Okay, And again, in, in a lot of cases, I'm going to be adding a negative number. So I'm going to actually be subtracting. And that's why I like to say over and under makes more sense for me. But then what makes this hard is I've got to adjust that for lot size, for quality, so, in a, so I've got, I can kind of start with historical basis, right? But then I'm also going to make these adjustments based on the kind of cattle that I've got. But the idea here is futures plus basis, which might be negative, usually is on heavy cattle, is kind of my Kentucky or my cash price market prediction. Another way that I like to do it, and this is how I'm actually going to teach you tonight, 
and then bring a little different approach uh, to our evening as well. I can track Kentucky basis, and I'm going to do that for you there. I think there's some value in having that, but also I can't make it unique enough to be yours, and that really is the problem. So I can give you some sort of idea, but when I talk about Kentucky basis, like I just showed you in that chart, what I really mean is how does the average Kentucky price, right, based on average quality, average lot size, all those things, how does that compare to the average futures price? Well, that's the best I can do. So the more individual you can make that, the better. Now, those of you that move cattle regularly, you probably tend to move a lot of the same kind of cattle. So you probably can get some sort of feel over time for how your cattle sell over the board. So I think tracking individual basis makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you've got, you know, if, if you want to run things by me or if you've got some numbers, I, I do have access to on a daily basis futures closes. So I'm, I'm happy to get those to you if you want to do some basis comparisons for yourself. So there's value in that. But, you know, kind of the way that I like to think about this to make it a little bit simpler is what if we just start with current basis? In other words, you know the kind of cattle you're going to be selling. Look at what those type of cattle are selling for right now in Kentucky and compare that to the current futures price. So, that, so in other words, start with the current basis for the kind of cattle that you're selling. And then we're just going to use that historical seasonality pattern that I showed you just for the seasonal adjustment. There's another advantage here that I want to make sure you understand is pretty important. And, and this is a perfect example of, of there's right now is a perfect example of why this matters. But so right now, transportation cost to move cattle, you know, out west, I'm guessing $455 per loaded mile, something like that. I'm probably pretty close. All right. You know, the three and five year basis numbers that I showed, Jim Greg and I were talking about this this morning, you know, probably that was at a time when I could move cattle for three, 350 a loaded mile or something like that. Okay. So basis probably is going to be weaker or more negative. You may be more under now than usual. So if I start with current basis, it does a better job in incorporating the current market conditions. And I think that's another advantage here too. Historical basis is useful but it's really only useful to the point that the current market kind of matches that one. And this is a perfect example in 2022 of how so many things have changed that current basis numbers might not be super useful to us. So I wanna do two quick examples and then we're gonna stop and take questions and talk for a bit if you wish. But let's say that I've got a load of 800 pound steers that I'm gonna be selling in August, okay? And we're gonna assume August futures are at 178 per hundred weight dollar 78 a pound. By the way, they actually closed today, I think about 179. So we're, we're really close to what would make sense here. Let's say I look at what the kind of cattle that I'm selling, roughly the same lot size and the same type of cattle I'm gonna move through the auction system or sell directly, however you wanna do it. And right now they're selling for about $10 an under. Okay, so in other words, if, so don't worry about August right now, think about current, right? If Mark's feeder cattle futures are at 150, you know, 155, those cattle are selling for 145. Okay, so what's current basis? So it's about 10 under. I'm gonna use that, and then I'm gonna just, okay, it's March now. How does basis usually change between March and when I sell those cattle in August? So we could go back to that chart I showed you and compare March basis to what August basis tends to be. And I kind of did that for you quickly in my calculation beforehand, but the honest truth is, August basis over the last five, three years, you know, the three to five years has tended to be about a dollar weaker or a dollar more negative than what August has been. Okay. So I take that $10 current basis. I'm going to add another dollar, subtract another dollar, right? So instead of using 10, we're going to be a dollar weaker typically in August. So I'm going to use an $11 under basis. Now I use that August futures price. It's at 178. I'm going to, I'm going to subtract that 11 or add a negative 11. My expected sale price for August for 800 pound for your favorite pound steers is about a dollar sixty-seven. Again, I've used current future. I'm used. I've used current basis, which should incorporate current transportation costs. And I've just kind of used those seasonal patterns to adjust. Okay, how does August usually compare to March in terms of basis? And let's say I've got another group of cattle. You know, same you know same type of cattle. I'm going to sell in October instead of August. Okay. October futures are 182. That's, that's pretty close to where they are right now. Again, current basis is about $10 under for March, right? 
again, I go back and look, okay, you know, October is a weaker basis time period. Usually October basis is about $4 lower, $4 more negative than March. So I'm gonna take my current $10 basis. I'm gonna subtract another $4. So instead of being under 10, we're gonna be under 14. Use that 14 under as my basis estimate. October futures are at 182. I'm gonna subtract 14. My October price expectation is about 168. Okay, so again, there's, there's different ways to do this and very sure a little different approach tomorrow. The most important things to understand to me are that you wanna understand the concept of basis. Not that you're gonna nail it, you're not. Okay, you're not gonna nail basis, you will not. It's frustrating, you're not, all right? Understand the concept and you do wanna make it second nature. So when you see a cattle, when you see a group of cattle sell, when you sell a group of cattle, don't just think what they sold for, also think how did they sell low the futures? Those cattle sold six back, those sold 12 back, those sold eight back. You know, think about it kind of in that sense. You almost want to start to speak the basis language. Understand futures are a price forecast, first and foremost. They're a price forecast. And basis is an educated guess. And there's tools that we can use. I showed you historical stuff. I showed you kind of one approach. Greg will show, another one, uh, Greg will show you a little, a little different approach uh, tomorrow evening. But you want to be, you want to have a process that you use to say, okay, if October futures are at, you know, 176, what does that likely mean for me here in Kentucky? And I always tell folks, because it's a guess, you want to be conservative. And you want to kind of avoid false precision, right? I could sit down and I could figure out basis to the penny if I wanted to on average. And I could say, okay, basis in, basis in October tends to be, you know, negative $11.23 on average. But there's a false precision there, right? So I always just kind of round use numbers. And as you're thinking through budgets, you know, we talk a lot about sensitivity. Just understand that, you know, you want to do some sensitivity around basis, right? Maybe you expect basis to be 1,200 ends up being 1,400. Maybe you expect it to be 600 ends up being 400, right? So in the same way you think about how does sale price impact, you know, my, my profitability, you know, when you think about sale price, right, you're really just, you're adjusting basis at the same time. So just do some sensitivity around that. So we covered several things with you this evening. We kind of laid the groundwork for the next three nights first. I thought Greg did a great job talking about value gain and cost of gain. I showed you one process here to think about how do I compare or how do I use futures prices to estimate likely sale prices in the future. So I think we can open up and take questions if there are some. Um, I've not been following the before we do the questions, I do want to remind everybody we will be back here tomorrow night uh, with the same webinar link if you registered for tonight um, to do budgeting for profit um, session two. And then again on Thursday for session three, which is managing and protecting your profits on Thursday night. So just a quick reminder that we're going to be continuing this series over the next two nights. Um, so Kenny, uh, we did have a question about, and you touched on basis a little bit in your presentation, but do you have any basis information on loads of feeder cattle in Kentucky from 800 to 1,000 pounds? Uh, cattle put facts puts out a three-year average basis on 850 pound steers by month in Kentucky and Tennessee, but we didn't know if you had anything more accurate for just Kentucky. What I'll have with the same thing I mentioned earlier, I've got average prices, you know, by weight. Um, the data, frankly, gets a little bit thinner when you get above about 900 pounds. So I can run it. I can run it for eights, 850s. I might can run nines. I couldn't go much beyond that. And again, what I'm going to have is going to be based on our average prices in the state. So you still have to adjust that a little bit for the kind of cattle you sell and what your typical lot sizes are. But, but that's something I've got access to pretty easily. I, I pretty much keep it for everything above from, I, I keep it for everything about seven to 850. I can easily run nines for you me too. It shouldn't take much time at all. So feel free to reach out to whoever asked the question. Um, the next question is, why does color seem to have such an impact on pricing between animals of identical frame and condition, i.e. black versus red? Right question for me too. So I'll give you my best guess, and I can tell you from you know from dealing with cattle that we deal with um, that you know there's there's good and bad cattle of all colors, right? You know all types of cattle are uh, there's the, there's good and bad across the board. 
Um, you know, a couple of things that people oftentimes say, um, you know, you do have from a, you know, from a feeding perspective, you know, you do have things like CAB that kind of sit out there and provide some, some incentive for black headed cattle. But, you know, even then we've, we've got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, similar programs in terms of carcass that reward similarly to what CAB used to do regardless of color. The other point I make is this, and I think it relates a lot to lot size, but if you go back and look at some of our work from years ago, when we used to look at sorts in these CPH cells, we'd have a black sort, a smoke sort, which really a Charlotte cross, and kind of a mixed sort. There were times when those black nose Charlottes, we call them, right, your, your smoke cattle, would outsell the blacks, you know, depending on the market. And it was more because in both cases we had we had loads of both types of cattle. Now, now mixed cattle almost always sell back because they're mixed, right? Uniformity pays. And the reason I mention lot size is because if you think about what happens at a lot of our auction yards, right? We have cattle run through, but in auction yards, you've got folks that are trying to put loads of cattle together, right? So from a practical perspective, what you know, what color are most of the cattle to come through? Well, they tend to be black, right? So if I'm a buyer putting loads together, I've probably got a much better chance of getting a group of cattle put together that are black than something else. So I think it's more sometimes, sometimes a function of the perceived, how easy it is perceived to put those loads together in some of these yards. I would also add, you know, from a, the Kentucky Beef Network marketing kind of experience too, that if you're raising a breed specific calf, uh, say a Hereford, um, I would encourage you to reach out to your Kentucky breed associations too. A lot of them are offering specific feeder calf marketing programs to help you take advantage of those breed specific calves. I know in Kentucky, we have the certified Kentucky Hereford sale that takes place in May and December. Um, and then I think there are other programs out there too. So also reach out to your breed associations. They may have some marketing opportunities for those colored calves. Um, so Kenny, the next question is, where is the best place to look at futures? Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. So I pull my futures directly from cmegroup.com, www.cmegroup.com. You can get 10 minute delayed futures there and they're free. Um, having said that, there's lots of services, you know, DTN, for example, there's several where you can get futures prices. So, you know, that, that's a pretty easy one to get. Um, when you go to the, when you go to the cmegroup.com uh, upper, upper left-hand side, you want to just look for agriculture. And then if you click agriculture, uh, slide down to feeder cattle futures and if you have questions, feel free to reach out, but they're pretty accessible and they, for what I do, 10 minute delay is perfectly fine and I, I go the free route. There's also some really good apps. Um, I don't like to promote one, but, but I, I tend to use Cattle Market Mobile and you, you can get future pretty easy that way as well. So. Okay, um, the next question is on basis estimate. Uh, what is the cash in the formula you use? Is that the settlement at the end of the month uh, just getting into this area? Yeah, I think I understand the question. So, so Becky, I think the question is, um, what is you? So, if it's the formula, when I use the term cash, and I, I probably could do a better job being clear about that. So, in my form, I'm thinking Kentucky. So, in other words, what I sell cattle for on the Kentucky market, meaning that's the cash market. If the question was about the CME settlement process and what actually becomes the, the CME index, it's an average of every group. It's an average of every head of cattle that goes through those 12 states, whether they be auction or direct, between 700 and 900 pounds. So it's everything. So again, if, if the question was about the CME index, it's everything that's actually sold. If it was my formula, cash simply means Kentucky price. Kenny, let me add to that. Just, I, I saw the question and I was actually- Okay, thanks. And that may have been exactly what he meant in the question. It may have also been, um, to me, cash may mean, in some cases, what, what the sale was at the actual sale barn that you were at, or it may have been just looking at the uh, Kentucky gotcha. yep. Department of Ag, their marketing bulletin, maybe an average for, for the last week type of thing. So that the cash could be either. It could be a specific sale that you were at or you heard about, or it could be a state average, or, or it could even be like a stockyard average that Kenny showed you kind of grouped into weight. So it, it could be multiple things depending on how you're looking at it. 
Thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. But. So, Greg, um, we did have a question about, can you go over how to determine two, three, four price slide or the definition? Sure. So <clears throat> when we say price slide and the way we're going to be referring to here today, today and tomorrow is, is really with a heavier weight cattle. So again, think about what you're typically selling at and, and maybe go up or down 50 pounds or go up or down 100 pounds. Um, the price slide for lightweight cattle will typically be a lot bigger, especially in spring. And, and so we're not really going to talk about that so much. When we're talking about price slides, it's really if we go from 750 to 800 pounds or 800 pounds to 850, how much is that price going to go down by? Um, so if, if say, the, the difference in price between a 750 and an 850 pound animal was was four dollars a hundred weight? That means the price slide is four dollars per hundred weight. And and I was going in fifty pound increments, so I was basically dividing that by two. So in other words, if the price went down four dollars a hundred weight, going hundred pounds, that means it would go down two dollars uh, per fifty pounds. So the next question is um, a big one. Um, and I'll let both of you maybe respectively answer it, but what is the best way of marketing your cattle? Hi, sell high, buy low. <laughs> well, I'll start as a, so there's, there's not an absolute answer to this question, right? It's what works for you. You know, a lot of people use the auction system, right? And that really is the simplest way to sell. You know, you've got a competitive environment, um, you know, a lot of the marketing is kind of done, and especially if you're moving smaller groups, it's good. You know, the other thing I think we take for granted with the auction system is, you know, you've got very secure payment. And I think we take that for granted, right? But because of custodial accounting and because of um, the bonding process, I mean, if you sell cattle to auction, you know, you, you've got virtually no risk of not getting paid. It, it's, it's as close to zero as it can get. So the auction system is a good way to sort of get started. Having said that, if you're moving loads of cattle, you know, internet sales work very well too. Commission tends to be lower. Um, you know, you, you can specify some things that, that work for you in terms of the way the cattle are weighed, how they're handled. You know, price slides are great to talk about, things like that. You know, but, but again, that's, that's largely for groups of cattle. So, you know, internet sales work good. And then, you know, you can price cattle off the farm too. And, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It takes a little more sophistication in terms of marketing, whatever this some tomorrow. But, you know, you've got to know what they're worth. You've got to know how to weigh them. You know, you've got to deal with negotiation and things like that. So there's, there's not a right or a wrong way to do it. But again, I think the auction system works well for most folks, especially when they're starting out, but, but there's other, there, there's other options out there too. And in the, the internet sales, I mentioned second, you know, they combine some flexibility with, with an auction system too. So you've got a lot of options. So, you know, look at what works the best for you. We'll talk a little bit more about some of that stuff. And I guess the second half of the program tomorrow you can do. Anyone want to add, Greg? No, that's that's good. So um, I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, we have time for just a few more. Um, you can use the Q&A box to type those in. Uh, we did have one of our participants um, copy and paste the link for the CME group that Kenny mentioned. So feel free to use that. Um, and we appreciate you dropping that link for us. Um, the last question we have right now is, uh, if I wanted to start a backer, background stalker operation today, what would be your best recommendations for me? Kenny, you want me to, I'll, I'll start on this maybe. Um, so, I'm assuming that maybe this person is in the cow calf business now and they're they're thinking so I'm going to kind of go from it from that standpoint. So in other words, I'm assuming they have some basic uh, beef cattle background that they just are looking to get essentially in a different enterprise. So um, I guess number one, you need to determine do you want to do this you know primarily on grass, which is what we'd call a stock or oper operation, or do you want to do it? kind of mainly on commodity feeds, which is what we typically call backgrounding. Um, so 
you know, we can't answer that. that that's something we'd really have to, you know, be a, a kind of a one-on-one -on -one discussion to figure out which, which of those approaches would work best. But I think I can say this safely, and I think Kenny would agree that that right now is is a very good time to to be in the stockering business, just because essentially uh, your grass is going to be worth a whole lot more because of the price of feed has gone up so much. In other words, backgrounding, you to a large degree, you know, yeah, our prices the the price slide is going to narrow because of that high feed cost, but um, but part of that reason is your feed costs are going up considerably from where they were one or two years ago. Um, versus a stocker operation, you know, essentially your grass, the cost of producing that grass really hasn't, you could, I guess you could argue if, you, if you're needing to use a lot of fertilizer, that cost has gone up. But assuming uh, that you don't, you know, you really, your cost structure would not have changed a lot. But the value of, of your grass, that value of gain that you're getting on those stockers, which we'll talk about tomorrow evening, is, is, is going to go up and is going to stay high as long as these feed prices are up. So I don't know, that's about all. Kenny, what, what could you add to that? I had a couple of thoughts. So first of all, um, you know, it's with a lot, if you truly are starting out, it's okay to start small. And I know that's frustrating at times, but you know, there's, you know, we, we're talking about the economics some this evening and well, the next two nights, but there's a lot to this, right? There's, there's health considerations, there's management considerations, there's feed, there's nutrition considerations. You know, there's so many things to think about. So start small, right? You know, spend some time learning what you need to learn about all aspects of the business, right? We're kind of focused on one. We're we're economists. That's what we love to do, right? But understand the other stuff is very important too. Um, and I guess beyond that, so the other thing I guess I would say is to the extent possible, you know, really try to manage your overhead cost. And you know, we, we see this with cow calf operations, but the same thing can be true about background and stocker type operations. You know, especially if you're small. You've got to make sure the investment you make in the operation matches the scale that you're at. And I think too many people want to start too big, too fast, and have way too much overhead before they begin. And if that's the case, frankly, you're probably kind of slipped to where you can start. So don't be afraid to start small, manage overhead cost, and by all means, spend some time understanding all aspects of the operation. This is one piece of it that we enjoy talking about, and we're going to enjoy the next two nights too. But understand there's a, there's a whole lot more to it to kind of investigate. So, so spend some time learning and investing yourself. Um, the next question is, do stalker and backgrounding uh, quality of calves, um, I, I think that they're asking, do they create, does quality determine price? Um, yeah, sure, there's no question, you see, different prices, you know, in Kentucky, you know, for a cattle different quality, right? There's, you know, there's types of cattle that folks want, quality being one, health program, you know, just how they look, ready to go, things like that. You see discounts for cattle that are, that are fleshy, discount, you know, you see premiums for value-added type cattle, premiums for fancy type cattle. So quality definitely matters. Definitely and load matters. lot, you know, yeah, we, found, we have found that load lots matter too when it comes to price. So quality helps, but load lots are a big factor in a lot of that. There was some work that Greg and I did, gosh, from Craig back in 2015, 16, and just, you know, kind of the extreme example we'll get tomorrow, but from, you know, we look at a single, hold everything that's constant from a single to a truckload of feeder cattle, 21 bucks a hundred weight difference. So lot size absolutely matters. And what we also found by the time you get to 10 or 15 head, you're capturing maybe 75, 80% of that load lot benefit. So, you know, the real story is avoid extremely low lot sizes. Um, so there's a question that has come in through the chat about, do either of you have any book recommendations to learn more about futures, et cetera, or video channels that you would recommend, um, that this is a really interesting conversation, um, and they want to learn more? Yeah, I guess that was mine too, Greg. So I, I have done a fair amount of futures and options programming in the past. And I do have some pubs that I could get. There's there's actually two pubs on our website. I don't have the links right handy, but I could get to you as well. There's also good information through the, through the CME group. They have some good publications that kind of walk through some scenarios and examples. Greg, you teach our futures and options class. Do you have something that you kind of recommend for your folks to use? I use uh, the CME pubs. And, and then there's okay. actually, and I should find out 
how available this would be for individuals. But, but one thing that my students really find helpful is there is a simulation. It's, it's um, run by University of Minnesota. Basically, you can join the game and uh, you, know, you can do cattle grains. Obviously, the folks here would, would do on the cattle side. But that is one of the best ways to learn futures is, is kind of a semi-active approach like that where you, you're playing a trading game involving cattle. Uh, but again, I don't know if individuals, I, I essentially have to register my class for that. It's possible that individuals can, can kind of do the same thing now. But the CME pubs are good that Kenny mentioned. If, if you just do a search, CME, futures pubs, something like that. Um, I don't actually have a book that I use because I've, I've not found a book that I've been happy with. So I, I use those pubs. And, and then that it's called the Commodity Challenge out of Minnesota. And they actually have or he has uh, some good pubs that he has written himself, very short modules related to that. And those probably um, would be available to anyone. So just to call attention to it, um, we did place a link for the evaluation for tonight. So we would appreciate your all's feedback for on this. And uh, Jonathan Shepard, or I will post um, the link to all of the University of Kentucky AggieCon publications here in just a second. Um, Kenny and Greg, we haven't really talked specifically about the quality of grass-fed calves um, as it relates to backgrounding. Um, do you all have any comments around that? Uh, are, are you, Becky, are you asking kind of stockering versus backgrounding? No, about the value, um, grass-fed calves specifically value-wise. I think it's coming more from a value-added standpoint. Maybe it it it's very vague. The, the, the question. Vague. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not. I mean, I, I will say this: if if the question is, are you going to get a better price for say 750 pound steers if if they were stockered on 100 percent grass or or if they were fed a lot and um, my guess is you'd pr you probably will get, assuming same type of cattle and same lot size, you, you probably will do a little bit better on the grass, just assuming they're a little bit thinner. In other words, on average, if you have a group of animals that are average flesh and ones that are fleshy, those fleshy calves, same weight, are going to sell a little bit less per pound than the other ones. So I don't know if that's what they're asking or, or beyond that. That's the only thing. I, Kenny, can you think of anything? Um, he says, thank you. You, you answered it. So okay. you, good, job. good job. Um, so Kenny or Greg, do you all have any closing comments before we kind of wrap up for the night? I have one quick closing comment that everybody probably wants to see and we'll shut this down in a second. But if, if you want Cape certification for tonight, you'll want to put this in, you want to put this on your sheet. And I'm real creative on these. So this is B-A-C-K-C-O-N-F number one. Tomorrow will not be number two though. So you'll have to log back on for tomorrow, but um, back conf number one as your Cape code. And we can look at rosters and see who's on. So put that in, put that on your form to your agent for the, this will go where the presenter signature would be. So. Other than that, I would just say thanks to everybody for staying with us and being on for sure. And thanks to Becky for hosting. Yeah. Thanks to Greg and Jonathan for working with us on, working with me on this. So with that, I'll just close this up. Um, so we just want appreciate everybody for joining us this evening and the funding from the Kentucky Agriculture Development Board and Fund. Uh, without their support, we couldn't host webinars like this for you all. Um, I do encourage you to join us again tomorrow night for session two, um, budgeting for profit, and then again on Thursday for managing and protecting your profits. If you've not registered for these webinars, um, you can do so at kybeefnetwork.com backslash webinar. Uh, these are free, so please join us again tomorrow evening, and we appreciate your time, and thank you for joining in tonight. Have a good evening.